Hey everybody, uh, my name is Gary Scavino and welcome back to my third video. My third, my th is that right? My third video? Yeah, it's your third. Like, it feels like my hundred and third. I am exhausted. Anyway, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you to everybody out there who has liked my videos and subscribed to my videos and writes comments. I read every single comment. I love them. They uh, sincerely make my day. So please keep the comments coming and make sure you're liking and subscribing. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a jam-packed video for everybody today. We're going to talk about green Sanzinia or Sanzinia in general. Whenever I have a Sanzinia in any of my videos, people seem to really just, they love them. They want to know about them. They want to know where to get them. They want to know how much they cost. So I thought today would be a great time to talk about Sanzinia. Uh, we're going to do our typical our product spotlight. Uh, we have a great product from somebody out there who uh, makes individual cages for baby arboreals, which I thought was just a great product. We're going to do our breeder spotlight. We're going to feature a hypomelanistic baby chondra that was only born uh, this past March, which is just really exciting for the chondro community. And we are also going to talk about nest boxes. It's breeding season. I know a lot of people out there are using nest boxes. Um, I don't use them. I don't have anything against them, but I'm going to see if I can't convince some of you out there not to use nest boxes. So in any event, we have a lot to get to today. Thank you again for joining me and let's get on with the show. So today in our product spotlight, I want to feature a cage. It's an individual cage made for baby arboreals, either baby green tree pythons or baby emerald tree boas. Um, if you see my first video, uh, I talk about the top three things everybody should know before getting their first baby arboreal. And in that video, I mentioned putting them in racks. And uh, after that video went out, a very good friend of mine, uh, Bill Stiegel from Phoenix Reptiles over in Texas contacted me and he said to me, first off, navy blue is definitely your color. And then he said to me, you know, racks are a great idea for babies, Gary, but I have a friend here in Texas by the name of Sabrina Vega who makes great cages for people who may not have a rack. They may only have one or two baby arboreals. They may not need an entire rack. So I reached out to Sabrina and she sent me one of her cages and I got to tell you, I am really impressed with it. It's shipped flat, so it comes perfectly flat and you have to assemble it. It took me at most 30 minutes to put it together. Sabrina has thought of everything. It is made of PVC. All the holes are pre-drilled. Uh, the track for the glass is all pre-cut. It went together so easy. Um, she gives you screws, everything you need. It's very accessible here. You can see you have pretty much access to the entire cage. Perches, everything Sabrina gives you, everything you need is here. Um, really cool little feature here, little light inside. Uh, as far as heating, put it around the back. This piece of PVC on the back is actually a little thinner than the other PVC, so it helps with penetrating the heat. She gives you a pre cut flex heat heat, it goes right on the back. She also gives you a pre cut piece of styrofoam, which helps insulate it. So, like I said, I am really impressed with this. Sabrina has thought of everything. I am going to put a link to Lottery Reptiles on the bottom of this video. I'm also going to put a, a link to Lottery Reptiles in the uh, description to this video. So, again, if you're out there and you only have one baby arboreal and you don't have a whole rack or you do not want an entire rack, this is an amazing option. I think this one sells for $100, $110 in that, in that range. She does make a bigger model, I think for you know more money. But again, for a baby chondro, baby emerald, I'm always gonna favor racks. I do love them. But if I didn't have a rack and only had one or two baby arboreals, I would absolutely go this direction. So check Sabrina out. So in today's breeder spotlight, I wanna highlight an animal that was produced uh, by my very good friend, Buddy Buscemi uh, in March of this year. Buddy uh, produced what appears to be a true hypomelanistic chondro. Hypomelanistic simply means lacking black pigmentation. Um, Buddy basically had several well-respected herpers, uh, you know, good with genetics, look at the animal and after uh, discussing with them, he was able to determine it was in fact a true hypo animal. Um, Buddy, if, you don't, if you're not aware of Buddy Buscemi, Buddy is half of Green Tree Python Keeper Radio. He does that along with Bill Stegel, who I mentioned earlier in the product spotlight. Uh, if you don't know Buddy or Bill, well, you must not be in the Green Tree Python community. They're uh, very well respected uh, gentlemen in the community. They happen to be, both be very good friends of mine. And if you don't listen to Green Tree Python Keeper Radio now, I suggest you do. I listen all the time. I learn something in every episode. I'm going to put a link to Green Tree Python Keeper Radio on the bottom of this video and, of course, in the description of this video. So I'm going to look at the notes here. Uh, back in March, as I mentioned, Buddy produced this animal. The dam, I'm going to put some pictures up here, uh, was by the name of Whiplash, is a half Jayapura type chondro, and it was a yellow neonate. And the sire, uh, Leggett, is what Buddy named it. 
is, uh, has some of that Bushmaster New Blue, they call it chondro blood. And he paired those animals together. He produced what appears to be a hypomelanistic chondro. What's really cool about this is that, yes, there are a lot of traits within chondros. You know, we have high yellow animals and we have high blue animals, but there are really very few, uh, if any, true morphs. Marshall Mendez uh, is working with an albino line of green tree pythons, and now Buddy is working with the hypomelanistic line of green tree pythons. So I think it's really exciting for the chondro community. Uh, I wish both those gentlemen the best of luck. I can tell you both those morphs are in very good hands, and I know both of those guys are going to be doing a lot with them. Hey, for future episodes of the Breeder Spotlight, if you have a, a pairing that you're really proud of, difficult to breed animal, it doesn't have to necessarily be arboreal, something you want to show off, please uh, send uh, me the information, just some general information about the pairing, pictures of the babies to Gary at GS Reptiles, and I would love to feature you in a future video. Hey, so I'm really excited to feature Sanzinia on today's video. Whenever I post a picture of a Sanzinia, uh, whether it's on Facebook or on Instagram, uh, people just, they're just drawn to these animals. They love them, especially people who have green tree pythons now or emerald tree boas. Um, you know, the whole thing about Sanzinia is that I take uh, for granted sometimes, I've been doing this for a long time, but I think most herpers out there, if you've been in keeping herps for probably less than 10 years, there's a good chance you've actually never seen these animals in, in the person, in person. Um, they're just very rarely at shows and uh, they're very difficult to obtain. So that's what we're going to talk about today is, you know, why are they so hard to find? Uh, we're going to talk about how to keep them, some just general overview of breeding, and then we're going to talk about, you know, pricing. That's another common question I get all the time. How much are Sanzinia? How much are... Uh, you know, the greens, how much are the mandarins? So let's get into that. And first we'll start off with uh, why are they so difficult to find? Well, the first thing you need to keep in mind and the most important reason they're difficult to, to come across is that they are CITES Appendix 1 animals. Now, what does that mean? Well, CITES, you know what I think I'm gonna do? I think I'm gonna call on an old friend to help me explain some of this terminology. Okay. In 1975, CITES was created. So what is CITES? It's basically the inter an international agreement between governments with the primary goal to ensure that international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten their survival. In short, it simply means that they are not overcollected. The term CITES actually means the Convention on International Trade on Endangered Species. So when you hear CITES, it just means they are protected in their own natural land and they cannot just be exported or imported that easily. What makes it even more strict in relation to Sanzini is that they are considered Appendix 1 animals. Appendix 1 simply means that that animal has been defined as being threatened with extinction. So again, there is no international trade allowed with Sanzini. So not only are they not allowed out of Madagascar, they aren't even if they were to be captive bred and born in a private collection in say somewhere over in Europe, those animals, even though they are captive bred and born over in Europe, cannot legally be exported out of Europe and imported into the United States. And that is just the first reason why it is so difficult to come across Sanzini in the United States. Okay, so after being CITES protected, another reason these animals are very difficult to come by in captivity is that uh, they're difficult to breed. Um, yes, there are litters that are produced every single season, but it's very sporadic. Uh, they do not produce a lot of babies in each litter and uh, when they do produce babies the breeders which is the third reason tend to hold mo most of the babies back or what they do that's actually a really good thing is that most sanzinia breeders tend to make sure that sanzinia their babies their offspring get into the hands of others working with sanzinia to ensure that these animals continue throughout you know private collections this is a baby green sanzinia uh, this was produced by my friend here in new jersey alan brutowski i very I feel very honored to get this baby. I only have three green Sanzini at this time. That's another thing I want to mention. While neither one are readily available, uh, mandarins are a little more readily available. There, there seems to be more baby mandarins produced every year. That probably has something to do with the fact that mandarins are bigger and they produce more babies. Greens are extremely difficult to come by. And again, I have three and like half the country out there where everybody's looking for more baby green Sanzania or just more green Sanzania in general. So now that we talked about why these animals are so difficult to find and so difficult to obtain, I want to talk about the differences between the western uh, Sanzania and the eastern Sanzinias, the greens versus the mandarin. So why don't we do that? Hey, so before I continue speaking about Sanzinia, let's talk about um, a gentleman who helped me a lot with this piece on Sanzinia, Paul Mitzelfeld. 
Paul, if you're not familiar with him, Paul exclusively works with uh, Madagascan boas. Paul, I consider a true subject matter expert in all things Madagascan boas. Um, Paul's been working exclusively with them for the past 10 years and uh, he produces litters pretty consistently. And the thing I really respect about Paul is that he always makes sure that his babies uh, get into the hands of people he knows are gonna work with them and they're gonna keep them for the long run and they're gonna uh, try to breed them to ensure that these animals continue in captivity. So let's first talk about green sands. And he is, this is a 2018 uh, male green. He was uh, produced by my friend Doug Taylor out in Seattle. And uh, the thing about green sanzinias, they call them Easterns. The uh, Latin name on these is uh, Sanzinia madagascariensis is what they are. And again, these are the Easterns, the greens uh, from the Eastern part of Madagascar where it tends to be much cooler at times. In fact, there have been, uh, Tom Crutchfield actually mentioned when he was over in Madagascar one time looking for the greens. Uh, he actually found them and he found some frost on the ground as well so these animals can tolerate some pretty cold temperatures i'm sure it has a lot to do too with the key as far as getting them to breed as uh, adult size these will hit a baby four and a half to five feet they are not very large animals baby size uh, or litter size i should say you're talking about seven to nine babies in a litter of green sanzinia babies are brick red just like the one i showed you similar if you're not used to seeing baby reds or baby greens and you saw them all in the same tub it'd be very confusing but uh, I could tell you that baby greens tend to be more of a brick red and baby mandar mandarins tend to be more of like a chocolatey, a brownish red. So uh, now that we've talked about greens, why don't we talk about the other species, which are the mandarins. Okay, so let's talk about mandarin sanzinia, which is sanzinia volantani with a V, volantani. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I don't have any mandarin sanzinia, guys, so what I'm going to do is put a picture up of an adult mandarin sanzinia provided by my friend Paul Mitzelfeld. Um, again, this is a 2018 green sanzinia. I'm just going to hold her just for the sake of holding her and showing her off a little bit. So western sanzinia or volantani sanzinia or mandarin sanzinia are from the western part of Madagascar. Main difference is that it's uh, more warm and dry in the area where they're from as opposed to the easterns and they tend to get larger than Easterns as well. Of uh, Mandarins uh, are in that, I'd say, five to six foot range. As far as litter size, they are uh, nine to a dozen babies, so a little bit larger than the Greens. Um, they call them Mandarins because as babies, they're Mandarin color. I mentioned that chocolatey brown that, or a chocolatey red, that brownish red. Um, as adults, though, they go through a full onogenic color change of, uh, they go into like a grayish, Gray, slate grayish coloration, brownish coloration with uh, kind of yellow highlights to them, sometimes orange, had, uh, orange highlights to them. I think mandarin are beautiful animals. They tend to be, a good portion of my sea, unfortunately, tend to be somewhat drab as adults, but overall, um, beautiful animals. The ones that are slate gray have that really cool coloration I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of. So uh, we talked about the differences between the uh, greens and the mandarins. Let's talk about now what they have in common. Okay, so what do green sanzini and mandarin sanzini have in common? Well, both, first off, they're super easy to take care of, just low maintenance animals. I always describe them kind of like an old relative in a nursing home. You could pretty much ignore them and they're gonna be fine. The next thing is, as babies with both of them, mandarins and greens, they tend to be nippy as babies and they really calm down as adults. Both of them are, as babies, they're arboreal as babies. As they, as they mature, they tend to become more terrestrial. In, in uh, Madagascar, they always tend to find adults on the ground and not up in the trees. Um, they are messy animals, I will tell you that. They love to spread urates throughout the cage. Every single day, I go into my enclosures with my sanzinia, and there are urates spread on the bottom of the cage, on the hide box, on the perches, in the water bowl. Just, it's an everyday occurrence. Um, as far as temperatures, 70 degrees ambient cage temperature. 84, 86 on the hot spot, they'll be fine. 60% humidity, they shed out in one piece every time, no problem. As far as breeding Sanzinia, I don't have any experience there, but I've spoken to enough people about it. Um, people seem to have success both ways, keeping the animals together all year round or keeping them separate. Um, I know people who have success in both ways. One gentleman I always knew out in California kept them together every day for the rest of their lives and he produced three or four litters and he was keeping green. So uh, they've been produced successfully both ways. As far as pricing, I don't like talking about pricing with snakes, um, but people always ask me, that's what they wanna know. So I will tell you, mandarins, which tend to be more readily available, $1,000 up into $2,000 a piece. It's a wide range, but that's what they are. Sometimes it varies, the price varies depending on the amount of white they have in them also. But 
I would say anywhere from minimally $1,000 to $2,000 a piece on mandarins. That's a price I think that you'll see. And as far as the greens, oh my goodness, they're just so infrequently available. I will tell you that greens, it's realistic that you're going to pay minimally, minimally for a green, $1,500 for a baby, up to $2,500 for a baby green. So hell, look, I hope that gives you a lot of insight and a lot of information about Sanzinia. If you get the opportunity to keep them, I suggest you to. They're just awesome animals. They're beautiful. They go through a great omnigenic color change. And uh, I encourage more people to start working with them. Okay, so for our last segment today, I want to talk about nest boxes. Um, hey, look, I am not anti-nest box. I'm just saying they add a potential complication when there doesn't need to be one. We all know what nest boxes look like, right? The traditional nest box, that square, small, maybe a Rubbermaid box people use with a small hole cut into the side and it has a lid on top of it. Uh, and typically what we do is we put them in our enclosures and we pray the female uses it. Most of the times, not most of the time, many times females won't use it. Because the opening is so small, a lot of females are not comfortable going inside. I've actually heard of uh, some keepers actually putting the female inside, locking them inside to ensure they use the nest box. That really only just stresses out the female. I've also seen females go underneath nest boxes or I see them lay their eggs on top of nest boxes. Here's what I do. I use these half cork logs. I stick it in the back of my enclosure. First, I add a bunch of cocoa chip to the bottom of the closure. I use this Pro Cocoa. Cocoa chip, it doesn't really matter which one you use. I know there's cocoa chips out there to the other brand. It doesn't really matter. This is what I'll use. Cover the entire bottom of my enclosure with it, and then I put the half log in. So what I do now is when I'm checking for females, if she laid her eggs or not, instead of having to take the entire nest box out and lift it out and disturb the female, lift it up, stressing her out more, and put it back in, all I do is give it one of these. I just take a quick peek underneath, underneath the log. I don't have to disturb the female. I can see if she laid her eggs or not. What I also do is by putting the bottom of this cocoa chip is that I don't care now for any strange reason she doesn't use this half uh, log. I know she's going to lay the eggs somewhere in the enclosure and she's going to be on the cocoa mulch and the eggs are going to be fine, safe until I find them. Now, I think the key reason, the difference is that why they use it so much has a nice big opening and females are just more comfortable using that big opening. So in any event, uh, if you use nest boxes, you're having luck with them, Great, keep using them, but I'm just asking you, give the half log a shot if you have a female tends she doesn't want to use a nest box. I think you're gonna be really happy with it, and I think it's gonna take a lot of stress out of a situation that doesn't really need to be that stressful. Okay guys, so this is gonna wrap up this video. Uh, a quick breeding update for those of you who have watched my last video, my 2020 breeding journey. Uh, my Silver Savu Python, as I mentioned in the last video, I was waiting for her to lay eggs any day. She still hasn't laid yet. Today is day 30, post ovulation shed. As you can imagine, I'm checking her you know, every morning and every night, still nothing yet. She looks great, she looks gravid, so I will keep you guys posted. Uh, the second thing, hey, I appreciate you so much watching my videos and I love all the feedback I'm getting. And the thing I will ask is that, uh, if you could just please take the time to like the videos and subscribe. It's really what makes me tick when I make these videos and it gives me energy to do more. So I'd really appreciate it if you could do that for me. And lastly, and uh, you know, most importantly, US ARC, uh, it does so much uh, for us and asks so little from us. So for $5 a month, you, you can uh, become a member of US ARC. I will put the link in the bottom of this video and again, always in the video description. So um, if you could do take the time to do that, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much and I will see everybody again in a couple weeks with a new video. Have a great day. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?